Thanks again for um, taking some time out of your afternoon to join us. Um, we are actually being joined by um, our Pitney Bowes and Visible Supply Chain partners today um, to go over a, a topic that we've got a lot of questions on, and that being the um, post office shipping um, as it relates to international specifically. Um, so we have a couple of um, presenters that are um, getting ready today. Um, Mark Hudson, Senior Director of Partnership Development over at Pitney Bowes, um, and Scott Mills, who's the um, Sales Executive over at Visible. So it's about right, right about two. So I'm going to let um, Mark go ahead and take it over and start talking post office. Thanks, Mark. Great, thank you so much. Like Karen said, my name is Mark Hudson. And I'm a senior director at Pitney Bowes Commerce Services. Just like to start off today by wishing everybody a very happy Flag Day. And I'm also happy to introduce my co-presenter today, uh, Mr. Scott Mills from Visible Supply Chain. So why don't we get into uh, today's agenda. First talk a little bit about who is Pitney Bowes, do a level set on what is cross-border, um, talk a little bit about cross-border compliance, uh, talk about DDU and DDP, because that's going to come up often when you're talking international. And then Scott's going to take us through um, the USPS and how to simplify this using the USPS for international shipping. So thank you all for attending. Very excited to be uh, presenting today. So first, quick intro into Pitney Bowes. Uh, at Pitney Bowes, we enable the selling of products and services from your company to your sellers. What we thrive on, what we live day to day, is helping our clients navigate that complex world of commerce. We provide data so businesses can market their best to their best customers. We enable the sending of parcels and packages across the globe. And we also secure payments through statements and invoices to keep your clients moving. We've been doing this for, for 97 years, and we've amassed quite a bit of, of data around that time that we offer out to our clients to make them more successful in their, their commerce endeavors. This is what we do on a day in and day out basis, and we've been doing it for a long time and continue to grow uh, every single every single year. So at Pitney Bowes, we're extremely proud to serve over 1 million small business customers worldwide and over 90% of the Fortune 500. As you can see by the logos, our customers include some of the largest brands and marketplaces on the planet. These folks trust us to, to manage their, their shipping lines both domestically, internationally, and get their products to their customers in the most expeditious and usually the cheapest way uh, possible. So cross-border is the new imperative. Cross-border is the new imperative and 93% of retailers globally are already operating or planning to go across the border. That's very, very important. Folks are starting to see, I can't survive domestically only. I really need to start serving a global market pace, marketplace. In fact, we survey all of our customers. And the one question that had the most consensus among all the retails, retailers is, who's going to be in cross-border? Nearly all of them raised their hand. And 93% raised their hand saying, I'm either doing it now or I plan to go into cross-border within the next 12 months. There was a small subset there that had no plans to go to go cross border. I would say they're probably selling American flags or something that's only domestically that they don't need to go uh, outside of the outside of the country. So, with 93% of retailers saying they're already cross border or they're going to be cross border, it begs the question: Is everybody talking about the same thing? Well, we often hear this. We actually hear it all the time. Oh, this is just logistics. This is just another shipping label. This is just another place for me to ship. Our response is always, yeah, we wish. You know, the logistics is the, the easy part. So let's talk about the, about the, real, about the real challenges and, and what's reality here. Now, let's start with, with fraud. You know, if you think domestic fraud is a problem, you know, shipping to, to Russia, China, shipping into Hong Kong, comes with its own set of, of compliance issues and fraud that you really need to be aware of and understand. Compliance, we've all, had, we've all seen the headlines, right? Someone shipping something that they shouldn't cross border. It's not good, right? You really need to understand your product and what you can ship and what are those, those compliance issues around that. Conversion, global consumers behave differently from domestic consumers, you know, especially at the, 
at the checkout. You know, different countries, you know, they're, they're shopping on their phones, they're shopping on their tablets. You know, domestically, we ship, we shop on our PCs, so that's not the same across the across the country. Same thing goes for customer care. Usually, that's a language problem. Global consumers don't all speak English, so you really have to have a plan for your customer care when going globally. And the two biggest challenges are all about attracting customers to your brand. How do they know that you're now going worldwide? How are you going to get these uh, international customers? So having that commercialization plan, very, very important when moving into a international uh, commerce situation. So global consumers have similar expectations, right? Global consumers expect similar services to, to domestic and are less likely to forgive distance as an excuse for a subpar experience. To them, they don't care, right? They see a product they like, they want to get that. And what's similar domestically and internationally is the shipping cost. Everybody wants it free or as close to free as possible. If it's a slow delivery, if it's taking a long time to get there, a lot of customers, just like we do, you know, you're going to lose interest probably in that product and may, most likely in that, in that retailer. Nobody's going to wait the six to, eight, six to eight weeks any longer to get that product. They want that in eight days or less. And returns, you know, a lot of people use the internet to try. You know, I'm one of those. I'll buy five, five items and, you know, I'll return four of them, right, and keep the one I like the best. But that returns policy needs to be clear and the process needs to be very easy for the customers. It's the age we're, we're living in. So consumers want it all, right? But if you force them to choose, they overwhelmingly, they're gonna pick free, right? They, they want shipping to be free. It's what they're used to. We call it the prime effect. You know, and shipping is the only part of e-commerce that isn't immediate. Meaning you take something, you, you find it, you drop it into your, into your shopping cart, you pay for it. Wow, that all happens rather, rather quickly. What doesn't happen quickly is the shipping, right? And that's the piece that you're paying for. You know, that's why free is key, or as free as possible to get it to the customer. Again, it's what they're expecting. It's what the marketplace is demanding. It's what Amazon and others are all forcing us to do. So the, the cheaper you can get it to the customer, the more likely they are going to be to return and buy from you again. So let's talk about cross-border e-commerce success. What makes a cross-border e-commerce shipment successful? You ask yourself, is it the right product or the right price? Is it fast shipping? Is it good tracking? Is it easy returns? The answer is simple. It's yes. It's all the above and more. Why? Because your goals, they're not just a great customer experience, right? We all want to have that great customer experience. We want to have that, that return customer. We want to continue to sell these products internationally. Not only is the great experience important, but not getting in trouble is just as important. So if you're not following these rules, if it's not um, being properly classified, if it's restricted product, if the packaging isn't appropriate, you know, there is, there's issue. This means that there are compliance checks and regulatory risks that you as the exporter must know, identify, and mitigate. Again, let's not get in trouble. Let's have a um, first class experience for your customers while following all of the, all of the rules. It's the best way for e-commerce uh, cross-border success. So there are many missteps or pitfalls for an exporter when they don't know their obligations as a responsible party in the transactions and don't apply proper due diligence. These include, and I'm gonna read these to you because they're important, failure to check seller and buyer against the nine party lists. Very, very important. Failure to properly declare hazardous materials, materials for ground and air transportation. You're not setting those lithium batteries up in, the, up in the air. Shipping to a sanctioned or embargoed country, incredibly important, right? Shipping controlled items without the proper export license. Assigning an incorrect HS classification to your product and into incorrectly declaring the country of origin or value of the, of the products. Each one of these failures or oversights carries various degrees of penalties and fines. It could be an inspection or a product seizure. You know, your product's gonna be held up um, there in customs. You could have a monetary penalty um, all the way to loss of export privileges or there are even times if you're really doing the wrong thing over and over again, you can incur prison sentences. 
Not to mention, your customers aren't going to be too happy if you're in the press or they're seeing anything bad when they're going to search you about, you know, you have improper export practices. It's a good way to, to lose some customers and repeat customers. So again, I want to make sure you're taking in mind what could go wrong and putting in these fail safes to make sure that doesn't go wrong. So now we've established that cross-border compliance is complicated, what do you need to do to get it right, right? We could start with some, some basics. First, know your product, right? What are these products that I have? What classifications do they fall into? Understand your customers. Where am I shipping to? What do they want? What are their needs? What are they looking from me as their, as their retailer? Know how to ship those products to your customers, right? Avoid everything that we had just gone through previously, right? And then know how to return your product. Very important, you heard me say it before, lots of us are out there, we're ordering multiple products, many different colors and sizes, so we're not really sure what we want, and we're gonna keep the ones that are right for us. If you make that returns process difficult for me, uh, the chances that I'm gonna be a repeat buyer are, are gonna be, are gonna slim, slim down from there. Let's talk DDP and DDU. These are two acronyms you'll hear often when discussing international shipping or starting your international plan. DDU stands for Delivered Duty Unpaid. This means the package recipient, your buyer, is responsible for all the duties and taxes of inbound shipment. So that means if they see it on your website and it goes for $24.99, but they're responsible for the duties and taxes, they're gonna incur additional costs upon delivery of that, of that product. DDP stands for delivery duty paid. This is where the merchants, the shipper, is responsible for all the delivery fees and shipment, including the duties, the taxes, and the tariffs. Now, as you can imagine, DDP is oftentimes gonna be more expensive, but it's gonna deliver that better customer experience. So again, I'm gonna see a fully landed cost. If I see that on the website, so I know I'm paying $90 for this, there's not gonna be any additional cost coming from me, that's great, that's a good customer experience. If you're unable to do that, right, either instance, you need to be very clear on your website and make sure the customer knows your policies. These international customers will get confused, they'll get angry, and they'll feel that they don't understand exactly what it is they're, they're buying and how much that product is gonna cost them all in. That's gonna result in an abandonment in the, in the shopping cart and most likely, again, we're not gonna get a repeat customer out of it. So your business model is gonna you know, dictate whether I'm gonna do a DDP or a DDU, but the main thing I'm saying here is whatever you choose, make sure that you're communicating that properly out to the customers so there's no surprises when they get their product. They're gonna be all excited to get that that excitement is gonna go away if they're slapped with a $90 fee to take delivery of your product. So be upfront and say, here's what everything is gonna cost, fully landed, uh, whether it's paid or not paid. So let's talk some international uh, mail classes. In a few minutes here, Scott's going to dive into greater detail on the USPS, but we do have these USPS international mail classes and we should, we should go through them. If we talk about our Global Express Guaranteed product or the USPS Global Express Guaranteed product, this is a one to three uh, business day service. This is a shared service with, with FedEx. We move on to a Priority Mail Express International. This is gonna give you a three to five business days, right? And obviously the price gets, gets less expensive the more time it's going to take for this arrive, to, uh, the package to arrive. You move on to your Priority Mail International. It's gonna give you the six to 10 business days. Then finally, your first class package in the national service. This is going to be the cheapest and the slower delivering, slower delivery times, and tracking is not going to be included. So that one, you know, if it's not an important product, if, you know, something that's really not imperative, someone's not waiting for it, you know, it's something that's a, uh, I don't know, maybe a return. This is where we would use that. The other one, you want to get it there quickly. You want to compete with the big guys. This is where you're going to have to have to play, mainly in that three to five business day. But again, Scott's gonna take you more through that and simplify this, this process. So let's talk about international shipping and how do you start with a familiar? How do most people start going through an, an international shipping campaign? Basically, you start with what's familiar. 
And what's familiar? The basic concept to simplifying international shipping is to start with shipping to international locations that primarily speak English and are located in Western Europe. So then you can get your, you know, cut your teeth on an English speaking uh, environment, understand the customs because they're a little bit more similar to, to the United States here, understand who your, who your buyer is. Once you get familiar with that and you're comfortable with how you're going to do your internationals to those English speaking countries, then you start to expand into the other countries. You'll be more confident, you'll have a, a better base to, to work off of, and you'll understand how to set this up a little bit a little bit better. So our advice again is always start simple, right? Start with what you know. We all speak English. Let's start with the uh the English speaking countries and move on and move on from there. So now we've got Scott Mills from Visible Supply Chain Management and he's going to take you through, you know, why shipping with the USPS internationally I can simplify everything I just went through. I went through all of this because I wanted to lay a, a baseline of how you ship internationally, what you should look out for, what are some of the pitfalls, what are some of the compliance and fraud issues you really need to, to, to think about while doing this. Now, once you start using USPS, and Scott's gonna take you through this, it simplifies a lot of what I, what I talked about. But again, if you go in with your eyes wide open, understanding the business and the cultures that you're going into, it'll make a much smoother international shipping process. So with that, I'm gonna hand that over to, to Scott Mills, again, from uh, Bizzle Supply Chain. These guys are the, are the shipping experts out there in the, in the marketplace. They're an enormous partner of both uh, VTEC and, and Pitney Bowes. And we're very excited to, uh, to to move this and move it on to, to Scott. So Scott, I'm going to hand control over to uh, over to you. Great, thank you, Mark. Give us just a moment as we switch screens here. There you go, Scott, you should have it now. No problem. All right, can you guys see my screen? I see it. Looks All good. right. Thank you, Mark. So like Mark said, uh, I'm Scott Mills, Account Executive with Visible Supply Chain Management. And uh, I'm gonna go over why you should utilize USPS internationally. So some of the first common concerns that people have when they're thinking about shipping internationally is, you know, what carriers do I use? There, there are a few out there. What do I actually, um, what are their benefits? What are their pros? What are their cons? So we're going to go over a little bit of, of those. We're also going to talk about international shipping costs. It's, it's not quite like domestic. Um, there's more costs to shipping overseas and being able to get it to those customers that uh, live in another part of the world. And so we're going to go through um, some areas that uh, we're going to do some cost comparisons between the different character carriers and then there's post shipment billing or surcharges and this is where a lot of additional uh, fees and costs uh, will hit you as a company um, and something to, to look out for as you're trying to make the proper selection of a, of a carrier and just to let you know that usps has worked hard to make this process simple but most importantly they've made this cost efficient and that's what we're going to go over um, on the USPS side. So uh, kind of just to do a high level of why you should uh, consider using USPS for international shipping, you're going to see lower costs um, versus DHL, FedEx, and UPS. There aren't those additional charges on the back end um, that you will see and that we'll talk about later, uh, what those are and what, their, what costs are associated to those. And then kind of touching a little bit about what Mark was talking about earlier, USPS does utilize DDU, um, which does put the uh, payment of import tariffs, duties, fees on the buyer. But just to let you know, we've seen uh, through experience with the industry that that's not always the case when you're shipping USPS. Sometimes those import tariffs, duties, and fees aren't actually charged to the buyer. Um, granted, that that is not guaranteed and that is not something that you should expect, but it's something that does happen. So it's something to keep an eye on um, when you're starting to ship internationally. If you do go the DDU route, 
some places aren't actually going to see those additional tariff fees um, and duties fees. So if you find out that there's a certain area that that doesn't happen, DDU would be an excellent opportunity to save not only you some money, but also your buyer some money as well. Um, whereas with DHL, FedEx, and UPS, most of it's going to be DDP, um, and that's guaranteed money uh, on import tariffs, duties, and fees. They're very well at uh, making sure that those um, costs are, are paid and uh, by the company. Um, and then, of course, free return services. USPS has done great work as far as um, being able to make return policies easy, whereas with, with the other carriers, you do see those additional um, costs when it comes to returns. So let's look at actually some cost comparisons because that's the biggest benefit of USPS. So the example that we have here um, is Priority Mail Express International for one pound packages. And the uh, prices that you're seeing here are our visible USPS rates at CPP minus 8%. And that's something that is available through a Starship. Um, and then we're comparing that to the published Priority Mail Express International rate of DHL, FedEx, and UPS. And so, our, and then we also march those down 20% uh, because they're most likely going to give you some kind of discount um, on their published rate. So, looking at this, you can see USPS is on the left side, DHL and FedEx, UPS uh, following. To Australia, USPS can ship it out for a one pound package uh, at 59.74. DHL for that same package will cost you $81.84, nearly $20 plus uh, cost. FedEx, $83.69, and UPS, $86.21. So you can see right there, just talking about base cost, USPS is far cheaper than the other carriers. Um, looking at Brazil, which is a great example, uh, USPS, $58.61. But then you look at DHL, 95.96, FedEx, 99.75, and then with UPS, you're in the hundreds. So you have $101 there. So when you look at this, and you can see Japan, United Kingdom, but when you look at this, you actually are seeing the drastic difference between the carriers and their costs. But these aren't all of the costs. And let me stress that before we move on to the surcharges. This is a comparison on base prices. So USPS, all you're being charged is that base price. So the 59, the 58, the 60, the 56. Whereas with the other companies, those prices that you see there for each of those uh, countries, that's only the starting price. And so let me show you what um, surcharges you need to be um, cognizant of. So here's a list of DHL surcharges that are commonly used so remote area service charge so if you're shipping to a zip code uh, in another country that is designated as a remote area by dhl you're going to get hit with 36 dollars additional charge or if it's a very heavy uh, package if that weight um, times the 0.36 is more expensive than 36 dollars you'll be charged that higher for, uh, that higher cost. Fuel is automatic, um, that 6.5% is gonna be automatically charged. Um, dangerous goods, so kind of talking about earlier, you know, uh, not just lithium batteries, but any um, items that are hazardous and need to be properly controlled, or otherwise, you know, there could be some danger involved, those are gonna be charged 98.25 on top of that base charge. Uh, if you're utilizing dry ice in your packaging, you'll be charged for that as well. And the list continues to go on. You see the lithium ba batteries, the consumer goods, overpriced pieces, um, and et cetera. So these are additional charges that are hitting you as a company um, to pay for just because you chose a different carrier. Um, so you need to really look at um, kind of what Mark was talking about earlier, know your product understand uh, what your product is, right? So, you know, are you gonna be hit with that dangerous goods, lithium batteries, consumer good, uh, additional charges? And if so, you need to consider those on top of the base price when you're comparing carriers. Um, but also then you need to know 
where you're shipping it to, right? Who your customers are. And if you're constantly getting hit with a remote area service charge, that's a good time to say, okay, wait, let's take a step back and let's evaluate this. Does it make sense for us to continue to go through this carrier receiving these additional costs when we can go the USPS route and save that additional money and be able to, you know, either do something else with that, make more product, uh, find more marketing material for customers. Um, also, a lot of this, these savings can pay for your Starship um, uh, subscription, right? So if you're, or if you're looking at, you know, I want to use utilize Starship, but you don't currently, being able to get access to our rate with USPS can balance out those costs. Um, so that's something to consider. And lastly, one thing that um, I, I love talking about with people is that with USPS, you have upfront billing. It's upfront. You know exactly what you're being charged. You know that base rate. There's no hidden uh, cost or fees on the back end of it. So with USPS, there's no surcharges. You know what that cost is and it, nothing comes back to you. Whereas with DHL, FedEx, and UPS, there is that additional billing process that does take uh, place after a shipment is complete. And so just to walk through a brief example of that, you have a one pound package that's being shipped to Brazil via FedEx. You're shipping that and it's 99.75, right? That's the base price that you see. But that destination is a remote area location. And so you're getting hit with that additional $36, which is gonna be charged back to you after delivery. And that just complicates the process. You thought you were paying 95.75 or 99.75, you ended up getting additional billing of $36 after the fact. And so you're, you're adding complexity to your, your business, which is something we are all trying to eliminate um, to succeed. And so lastly, I kind of wanted to go through and, and really just sit down with you and, and say, why ship internationally, right? And I wanted to do that through the use case of a company. And we're gonna call them ABC company in this example. But basically, ABC Company saw that they were receiving a lot of viewer traffic from a specific region in Europe, but they didn't have international shipping turned on. And the reason why they didn't have it turned on was because they lacked international shipping knowledge and experience. They kind of shunned away from it just because they hadn't dove into it yet. Um, so their customer profile was 100% domestic, but they were still doing great. But as they saw this larger viewer traffic, they were really intrigued by it and curious what they could do to actually bring those customers into their business. And so they had a conversation with the, the um, software company and some um, shippers and found out how simple and easy it was to actually ship internationally utilizing the post office, USPS. And so after those conversations and they, they talked about some details, they then decided, okay, we're going to activate our international shipping and give this a try. And then over a year or so, they saw a drastic uh, change in their customer profile. It went from being 100% domestic to 30% domestic and 70% international. I mean, imagine the transformation of a business going from 100% domestic to just 30%, meet, not saying that they were losing customers, but that they added 70% more customers, which were international. So you really need to take a step back and think, how successful are you domestically? Where is your traffic coming from when it comes to your site? And who's looking at your materials, your products? And if you do see a large viewer traffic outside of that, those are opportunities to expand your business. And in this use case, a drastic one. So think about if you're not shipping internationally currently, what uh, potential are you missing out on? And how can that truly change your business to bring even more success? And I'm telling you, USPS is an excellent option because it's cost, cost efficient. Um, as was spoken earlier, Amazon's utilized the multi-carrier uh, solution as the way to ship. And so that's the best practice. 
is to have multi-carrier solutions, be able to play them against one another to get your costs down to the cheapest that they can be. And when it comes to international, the prices are drastic, but the services aren't, aren't that uh, different. They're very comparable when it comes to delivery times, uh, the quality of the delivery, and the safety of the packages. So um, definitely take a look at USPS as the option or as an, an option for uh, shipping internationally. And that's what uh, I'm here for. That's what um, our partnership has created is a place where you can come, you can ask the appropriate questions. And if we don't have the answer right away, because international, there's tons of countries with a lot of different rules, but the beauty is we'll set up a meeting with you, be able to sit down and talk through your business, talk through your use case, and be able to bring forth a solution that will help you to have more success in the future. Um, and that's it for me, so I'll turn the time back over to Mark. Thank you very much.